why use herbs? Um, so V. medicatrix natura, this is one of our principles of naturopathic medicine, which means in Latin, the healing power of nature. And I like to always just start before we start talking about constituents and pharmacology and all of you know, the, the research and that we have to support the use of herbs. I, I love this picture of lavender, this beautiful field. And I like to kind of imagine, if you can for a second, yourself standing in this field and what that would feel like in your body, the smell, the sight. Um, and I think we would all agree that that would feel pretty amazing. There would be um, a very much a sense of calm and ease and beauty. Um, there is, you know, the same, unless you really don't like lavender, <laughs> which some people don't. But I think for most of us, you know, or we could say standing in a forest or just being around nature, being around plants, having a garden to tend to, even having a little potted plant. Um, I know, Sarah, you mentioned your little uh, standard process uh, potted plant that you have, and I have mine too. You know, little things like that around you and in the home make a really big difference in our lives. And I believe that tapping into that and something that's referred to as biophilia in the research, which is this kind of innate natural kinship that humans have with plants, um, is something that people really understand and herbs really fit that um, that you know when we are using herbs in our body it makes sense that when we're connecting and healing with them in our environment that they can have really powerful uh, effects on our physiology as well so you know where there's lots of different modalities we can choose from but i think herbs are incredibly unique um, they really are concentrated medicinal foods is the way i like to think about them and if we break down in this slide we have a picture of some beautiful schizandra berries here and you could use the example of lots of other different berries that we might consume in our diets but schizandra specifically is one that will be rich in certain micronutrients and macronutrients but especially rich in those phytonutrients and that's really where you know, we we use our herbal medicines shine and so we're, we're choosing and using herbs that are in are higher in specific metabolites that plants are creating for their own purposes that are not essential for our life, but um, are essential to the plant's life in ways that we are just sort of learning to comprehend, and, but we know can have powerful therapeutic effects within our body. And so, you know, plants are very complex networks of these, these hundreds of thousands of different chemicals, the human body is also a complex matrix of many different compounds and chemicals. And there is, I think, a mirroring. We've, we've co-evolved alongside plants. And so our bodies recognize a lot of these compounds, which is, is something that will definitely be explored when um, in Slavko's talk, and we're talking about the endocannabinoid system today, and we will touch on that a little bit as well, this kind of natural fitting of a lot of these phytonutrients with our own physiology and, and understanding just how many beneficial effects that can have, and especially in regards to inflammation, which is the focus of our talk today. So um, I'd like to, maybe some of you have had this question posed to you before by me, but I always like to start with this. Um, question to you all. So which of the following herbs would you consider to be anti-inflammatory? Maybe some of you are looking at this plant, this uh, rhizome on the side here, and you know already which herb we might be talking about in some depth today. So uh, chamomile, turmeric, boswellia, hops, hawthorn, rosemary, milk thistle, none of the above, or all of the above? So uh, this is kind of a cheeky question because what I'm trying to get across here is that really none of the herbs are, I would consider anti-inflammatory, even though all of them might be considered anti-inflammatory in the sense that where we talk about inflammatory herbs, we call them anti-inflammatories. But really, as well, I hope a big takeaway from today will be is that herbs are not anti inflammatory. They are much more modulators of the inflammatory process or mediators of the inflammatory process. Another kind of takeaway from this is that almost any plant medicinal herb that you can name is going to have this anti-inflammatory or inflammatory mediating effect. So some are going to be, um, and we'll talk about, you know, 
differences, key differences between some of these herbs today, but some are going to be what I like to call the big guns. So the ones that we have a lot of good research behind and we understand their mechanism of action and we know how strongly they can act. They're maybe able to cross um, the blood brain barrier or stay active within the plasma for longer. Uh, than others. Some of them are going to draw from more of their traditional uses and we don't maybe have as much research to draw from, but, but all of them are going to be mediators of inflammation. And so just for the sake of simplicity for today's talk, I'm going to continue to refer to them as anti-inflammatories, but, uh, but keeping this really important uh, concept in mind as we go through is, is key. So, um, so really, it's just increasingly accurate to refer to our herbs not as anti-inflammatories as all, but modulators of the physiological process of inflammation that is all about creating kind of a delicate balance of what's required in order for the inflammatory process to resolve. When I think anti-inflammatory, I'm thinking drugs. When I think anti-anything, antibiotics, for example, I'm thinking a complete inhibition of the inflammatory process or of a bacterial replication, for example. And you know, we know that anti-anything is not without its consequences. And so we want to retain this sort of wide array of constituents in plants as opposed to using singular monotherapies or high, specifically high dose um, monotherapies of individual constituents because we want to continue to work with the, the, the body's biological processes. We want to target multiple cellular signals and pathways involved in gene expression, for example. We want to help mediate immune cell activity. And herbs have this incredible ability, many of these anti-inflammatory herbs, to also simultaneously repair damaged tissues and help us remove metabolic waste. So all of this is going to help us overcome inflammatory challenges much more effectively. Um, so, you know, there are different ways for us to choose between them. And this is something that I hope will be a takeaway today as well. We will talk about more a few herbs, some of my favorite anti-inflammatory herbs in there and their specifics. Some will, of course, have this um, a, a stronger impact, I want to say, on dampening or modulating, especially that, that initiation phase of inflammation, but not uh, blocking it, as we'll see, which is, which is so key. And as we choose our herbs, so we want to look at traditional use. So many of these plants have been used for hundreds of years, and it's incredibly valuable to look at how doctors and practitioners and various sort of healing medical models have been using those herbs. That's a huge source of information for us. And often we'll see that there was either a tissue or an organ system affinity for many of these plants that was recognized over time. And I think a very common one that people are referred to is Hawthorne for the heart, for example. We understand that Hawthorne has uh, an amphoteric effect on, on our cardiovascular system. It's incredibly antioxidant towards our cardiovascular system can be used in especially high blood pressure, but in just tonifying the whole of the cardiovascular system. Um, we'll see that other herbs have these tissue or organ assisted affinities, and that sometimes will make them higher priorities when you're choosing them for your patients. We want to look at an individual herb's constituent profile. What do we know about the, the array of different constituents or would also be referred to as the phytochemicals or secondary metabolites found in the plant. What do we know about what they do within our bodies and how bioavailable they are? And that's going to vary in, with every herb, the degree of evidence we have, the quality and availability of evidence, both preclinical and clinical, about how these herbs are acting. Um, some practitioners are going to feel much more comfortable just sticking with herbs where we have really strong evidence and others might be more um, comfortable with leaning more on the sort of the traditional uses and not needing as much of those, you know, RCTs, for example, to, um, to feel confident that they could use a herb. It's, it's really an individual um, thing, I think. I like to combine a little bit of both in my, in my practice. There's also going to be potentially an ideal route of giving the plant. So, and dosing, absolutely. We're going to look at internal dosing options. Sometimes topical dosing can be really ideal, especially when we're dealing with um, musculoskeletal inflammation, muscle pain, joint pain, things like that. So that can be really important. Sometimes even different um, solvent extractions. We want to ensure that we're getting enough of the individual constituents that we're after, that they're going to be potent and active in the medicines that we're taking. And then, of course, every herb is also going to have its own um, range of potential safety concerns, whether those might be adverse effects, 
toxicity or potential drug interactions. And, you know, this is a whole, uh, Carrie Bowen did an amazing two-part series on nerve drug interactions this past week. Um, the, those webinars were really enlightening. And, you know, I think that we, he did such a good job of just kind of bringing some reason to when we talk about these types of safety concerns. And of course, we need to always be prudent. And sometimes a more conservative approach is going to be better if you're newer and a little bit less comfortable with using herbs. But I think that there is, again, I want to um, just address this fear of herbal medicine that a lot of people might have, where either herbs are going to be really dangerous and should be avoided. Um, the, I, I've found that often the people that believe that to be the case in the majority of, of patients um, also believe that they are kind of inert and don't do anything at all and don't recognize this huge in-between of therapeutic potential and just understanding, you know, doing due diligence, looking at safety profiles, of course, but, you know, treating the individual and, and understanding that these, these herbs do have effects. As long as they're dosed appropriately, they can absolutely be, be used safely is, is my um, personal stance. So um, when we talk about anti-inflammatory constituents, these are kind of, I've pulled out some major groupings, I would say uh, classes of chemical compounds found in plants that some of these you might be more familiar with than others. Um, there are going to be specific compounds found within these groupings that are, are more heavily researched than others, but these are all in their own way going to be anti-inflammatory or modulating of the inflammatory process. And there are many more, like really, as, as I mentioned at the start, how nearly any herb that you can name is going to have this ability to help resolve inflammation. The same sort of goes for many of these phyto constituents, these phytochemicals, they are all potentially going to be supporting the resolution of inflammation, some a little bit more um, targeted than others. And just remembering that many of our plants are going to contain a mixed bag of these constituents. So many constituents working together to have this inflammatory modulating effect. And so again, um, just collaboration is what the, the word that keeps coming to mind that I, I'm thanking Rebecca for bringing up this morning. Uh, and you know, we are starting to recognize and, and very clearly that these compounds have this ability to match our own um, physiology potentially better than synthetic ones can, which of course, uh, and I can't remember what the statistic is, but it's just a huge, large, a huge number of drugs, more than half of pharmaceuticals have been derived from plant sources. So you know, those synthetic versions, I think, are, are not necessarily going to be a better fit, especially when we think about adverse effects, of course. Um, herbs are considered, I think, when used at appropriate doses, to be much more gently, um, oh, I should say, effective, but much more gentle in terms of their risk of adverse effects. So back to inflammation. Inflammation, what it, I think, um, I won't spend too much time here. I think this will get discussed later today in some depth, I'm sure. But, you know, I think we all are aware that inflammation is a healthy and normal response of our body. It's a necessary stage of wound healing. It involves um, a, a, a initiation phase, followed by a resolution phase, followed by termination. And that's really important. We, we don't want to suppress that initiation phase because it's required for the resolution of our inflammatory, um, of inflammation for really for repair and, and wound healing to occur. But of course, when uncontrolled, it can become a problem. And reasons for it becoming uncontrolled, I think why we're so, it's so difficult for us to resolve inflammation is because we live a very stressful life. And, mo and many of us, the impact of stress and also just lifestyle factors make it very difficult for these processes to resolve effectively. Um, you know. Just a reminder, there's some, some great resources here, references you can look at that uh, you know, we're really just discovering more and more about this idea of you know, this whole new area of pharmacology really that's being referred to as resolution pharmacology, that we're understanding this is an active process that we want to support the body's ability to resolve, repair, and regenerate rather than suppress, which has been traditionally the way, of course, we've looked at inflammation is just stopping it in its tracks. And so how do herbs help? Um, I've mentioned now a few times that they are modulators, absolutely. They 
can, you know, I put a picture here of the inflammatory cascade, what we're all pretty familiar with. Then I, I had intentions of this slide of putting up a few key herbs and then um, highlighting which enzymes, with which um, cytokines they might be modulating. And let me just say that this would have taken me hours and hours and hours. So I got as far as putting up a few, such as turmeric and ginger on the left here, uh, as well as um, we have uh, Boswellia and cat's claw on the right. Um, I think that, you know, again, they're, they're, the take home here is there's no single approach here. They're, they're working on a multitude of influences within the inflammatory cascade, as well as we'll talk in a second about even affecting gene transcription factors and um, such as NERF2. And so, and I like always thinking that, you know, herbs have been dealing with inflammation for so much longer than we have. They have literally been around um, and, and working through the process of photosynthesis and having to, to deal with free radical production in such extreme ways and that they've really developed these, I want to say like elegant orchestrated abilities to deal with excessive free radical production and, um, and inflammation in general to be able to recover it. So they do lots of, <laughs> lots of things and it's really shaped by, you know, I, we want to be creating this sort of delicate balance between positive and negative feedback loops, not just in terms of inflammation, but also as we'll see when we talk about stress and the HPA access, I think we keep coming back to this idea as herbs being balancing and modulators of these, of these really important recovery processes. Uh, NERF2, so Carrie Bone has done a great job sort of, I think, highlighting the importance of NERF2 activation and how phytonutrients, so key phytonutrients within a variety of plants can also support and, and act as NERF2 activators and support this antioxidant, uh, this activation of uh, our antioxidants, as well as detox pathways which is really important, not in just controlling oxidative stress, but also in resolving wound healing. And many phytochemicals have been reported as NERF2 activators, probably the most wide, well, the most widely studied for sure have been curcumin and sulforaphane, which is found in our cruciferous vegetables. And so NERF2, if that's something that is new to you, this is a, a central protein transcription factor that is, is involved in our responses to oxidative stress and detoxification. And we're just learning so much about the importance of, of this pathway too. This was a great review. I just wanted to um, bring your attention to, again, I thought uh, it did a great job of looking at some of the differences between the mechanisms of anti-inflammatory drugs and herbs specific in inflammatory disease. And again, just sort of highlighting this idea of their ability to modulate our physiological processes to balance inflammatory and anti-inflammatory mediators and as well do this with, um, within our immune system as well. So of course, inf inflammation and in our immune system being so tightly connected. And then this, I think, is a really important slide when we talk about inflammation and stress. So, so stress and inflammation really cannot be separated in terms of uh, allowing each to resolve that can kind of create this sort of a vicious cycle in our body. And I, I like this slide because it is showing there the initiation, the resolution, the termination phases, showing how the production of say prostaglandin PGE2 is required in order to activate that eicosanoid switch that allows the resolution phase of inflammation to occur. So we don't want to suppress in that initiation phase. The really the place where herbs can really shine, I would say, is during the resolution phase of inflammation. So, a little picture of turmeric there, um, a beautiful turmeric rhizome that is is going to be acting to um, to again not suppress but help it to resolve. And then I also like that this slide is highlighting the importance of the balance between cortisol uh, and the necess necessity of us to have enough cortisol and cortisol in balance when it's needed to help us overcome um, the inflammatory state as well. Um, I like that the, so, and, you know, and then highlighting that we're going to talk about adaptogens today, but keeping in mind that pretty much every single adaptogen that we use is also 
going to be a powerful anti-inflammatory. And I think one of the first ones that comes to my mind is licorice in this regard. Uh, we want to always be ensuring, if we can, an optimal HPA balance and not an overactive HPA access in order to ensure that inflammation can resolve appropriately. They're just so, so connected. And I think the herbs, um, so many of our herbs, of our adaptogens are just innately working on these, these inflammatory, modulating these inflammatory processes. So the endocannabinoid system, this is, I'm really excited to hear Slavko speak uh, about this in, in some more detail. I've heard him speak on it before and it was yeah, just awesome. Uh, in terms of, of plants and how they affect the endocannabinoid system, of course, we'll, we'll mention hemp today and, and cannabis. Uh, there's other plants that I wanna highlight as well that may also have a role in helping to modulate tone of the endocannabinoid system. And recognizing, I think, that the endocannabinoid system is just this regulator of optimizing and balancing both the HPA axis as well as our immune and nervous systems. There is, um, so endocannabinoid cycling is involved in what's something called the fast feedback loop, which is a regulation of the HPA acts, um, I should say specifically of stress acting upon the hypothalamus. We do know that acute stress can lead to increased activity in the HPA axis, downregulate CB1 receptors and increase FAAH levels. So that would be uh, an enzyme that is actually breaking down our endogenous cannabinoids, and that chronic exposure to stress can dampen endocannabinoid signaling and its ability to effectively regulate H the HPA axis. This is the slide that I thought, uh, just as a nice visual, would put together how the, the, com the communication between the endocannabinoid system and the HPA axis. And, you know, we are, we're still just learning. This is, um, you know, very new, but exciting, I think, evidence. And I think for myself, at least, when I learned about the endocannabinoid system, when I learned that that was a thing, <laughs> that it existed, that there was this complex system, physiological system within our body that none of us knew even existed until cannabis, this plant, showed us existed, just he took me he took my breath away and really i think speaks to just how powerful plants can be and how much we still have to learn um but anyhow i think that the and i've heard this analogy before which i'll share which i i like this is an analogy from dr terry willard who's a herbalist in um in, in well, vancouver island and he likens the endocannabinoid system. So in terms of, he has this analogy of how it, it, it it's of messenger systems. And so if the endocrine system is snail mail, so you put a letter in the mail and you get uh, a message that's delivered somewhere else in the body, that'd be like snail mail, putting a letter in the mailbox. And the nervous system is like a telephone call. So you're um, you know, getting this kind of direct message sent a little bit faster through the nervous system, but um, requiring this kind of wiring, then the endocannabinoid system can be thought of as like the internet. <laughs> so it's like this overarching interconnected link between our nervous and our, endocrine, and, and our endocrine system. And herbs, of course, like cannabis and others that we're learning can potentially help us to improve the tone or endocannabinoid tone. And you might hear that referenced and wonder what is endocannabinoid tone and it really is this kind of collective functioning of endocannabinoid receptors our endogenous endocannabinoids and the enzymes that are involved in either up or down regulating all of those and low tone can lead to something referred to as clinical endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome which has been linked to many different systemic pathologies and, and high tone can also cause problems and has been associated with obesity, in fact, and other obesity associated disorders. So, you know, I think though, when we're trying to address inflammation and stress, uh, we wanna be focusing on herbs that we know act on the HPA axis, of course, our adaptogens, our anti-inflammatories, which there's going to be lots of overlap with, and then cannabimetic plants, which are those that are also potentially working within our endocannabinoid system. So things like Boswellia, for example, that we know is powerful, are the powerful anti-inflammatory, 
we are learning may contain constituents that also have cannabimetic properties. Curcumin may also have cannabimetic properties and echinacea, it's agle amides, also acting on CB2 receptors, for example. And there's, there's many others, and like I say, it's still early days, but I think it's just really fascinating that we're learning more and more about these plants and their role on this, this, really, this really beautiful physiological system. We know, again, and this I think will be focused on um, more later, so I won't spend too much time, but that the endocannabinoid system and inflammation, and our ability to resolve inflammation are totally connected. The CP2 receptor, of course, has been shown to modulate immune cell functions, and that various plant constituents, as was mentioned, can bind weakly to the CB2 receptor, as mentioned, um, beta carophylline, the terpenes that are found not just in cannabis, but in other plants as well, the acyl amides and DIM and um, uh, cruciferous veg. So looking at more of these plants and kind of aiming to modulate CB2 signaling can definitely have potential here for both immune system and inflammatory modulation. And then this was a uh, a recent, so Ethan Russo, if you're not familiar with him, he's kind of a, like, say, a leader in the field of cannabis research. And this was a good, um, he, uh, beyond cannabis, so looking, I think this was a good review of some of the plants that also might have effect on the endocannabinoid system and this, um, uh, you know, exploration, if this is something you're interested in, uh, I think is a good place to look. I should mention as well, there was also a, um, there was another recent. There was another review recently that is slipping my mind at this moment by Kumar, 2019 review by Kumar that also did a good job looking looking into this. I'd be happy to share that with you all later. So, a case study. So I wanted to try to make the herbs that we talked about today a little bit more applicable, and we'll do that now in the context of a case. Uh, so this is a 35 year old woman who was suffering from wrist and back pain for three months. It was interfering with her activities of daily living. She described the pain as kind of constant and low grade, but worse in the morning. And, you know, I think the key in this case was obviously she's dealing with MSK inflammation, but stress was really high and she also was not sleeping well. So that is going to greatly impact her ability to resolve the inflammation and get her back to feeling her best. The you know, approach that we want to have here obviously is, is to help resolve the inflammatory process, to reduce her pain, improve her quality of life, promote local tissue repair, regeneration, support the removal of metabolic waste. That's a really important part of the resolution of uh, promoting resolution of inflammation as well. And of course, be working on her HPA access to improve stress and, and her sleep because that's going to be fundamental. And then this I like, I always like to include this in my slides. This is just taken out of Carrie Bone's clinical guide to blending herbs that are overall goals of herbal prescribing to keep this in mind when we talk about any of the plants today. We of course want to do no harm. So you know, be in, you know, most of the time these herbs can be very safe. It's always a good idea to just ensure that there aren't any toxicity concerns that you might need to be aware of for your patient. Those are going to vary based on the patient. You want to meet the needs of your individual patient. Things like compliance are really important. How willing are they to do what you would like them to do? We want to improve their resilience. And that is what it, you know, this kind of key thing with herbal medicine, I, I want to say again, is it's not about suppressing symptoms with herbs. It's all about nourishing the body so that it can function more optimally over time. That's really where herbs shine and less thinking of them like drugs that were just giving them to do one certain thing. Uh, we can use herbs that way sometimes, and we'll talk a little bit about that as a dosing strategy later, but it's much more about this ongoing support. Um, and then as we're doing that, we want to obviously, we need to factor in these, you know, what are some sustaining causes of the inflammation and of the stress in their life. You know, herbs aren't a Band-Aid for poor diet and lifestyle habits. Uh, we need to be addressing lifestyle and diet and all of those other things, of course. And then looking at herbs, uh, trying to choose our herbs as consciously as possible, knowing that there are some sustainability issues with herbs and, um, and ensuring that we're, we're if, if possible, using ones that are not at risk of over-harvesting, which is the case in some, in some cases. So 
herbs of their inflammation. Let's talk about some big guns. And so we couldn't do a talk obviously about herbs and inflammation and not talk about turmeric. And my challenge to myself today was, what could I teach you new about turmeric? What haven't you heard about turmeric before? Because this is obviously a widely used and widely discussed herb and curcumin is um, arguably the most researched plant compound uh, on the planet. So, you know, and with all that being said, this has also been used for millennia for, you know, whenever a plant has been considered this important for such a long length of time, and especially when it's been used as well as a food, as a traditional food by so many human beings, uh, it really, you know, you want to look, you want to look deeply at what's what's going on this is a really important plant and um, so i love this picture of it here just as a reminder that it it's a it is the rhizome that is used of this plant which is like a secondary root as opposed to the root systems that go a little bit deeper into the soil and it produces these absolutely beautiful flowers it's closely related to ginger and contains a very similar array of phytoconstituents and as a food, I just like to include this picture on the bottom right here. This is me making my um, a turmeric honey, which is literally just taking my powdered turmeric and adding it into my honey. I always like to try to find ways to incorporate herbs into my diet and kitchen remedies. And that's this is one I, I really, really love and can just be spread on toast or put in your tea and has lots of different applications. Anyhow, so there's a lot more to this plant than just being anti-inflammatory, I want to say. It also contains a lot more than just curcumin, even though curcumin is, uh, I would say, of most interest to us. It is one of a selection of curcuminoids that are found within this plant, fascinating polyphenolics that are lipophilic polyphenolics, which is a bit odd. So they do require a relatively high, um, a good solvent for extraction to get a good quantity of curcumin. And we, we may be aware curcumin is not extremely bioavailable towards the body. It is, um, our goal is to try to find ways to increase its absorption um, through the GI tract and also its ability to uh, exist in the plasma for longer and to cross the blood-brain barrier in, if possible, which is not the case for many of our constituents, but ones like curcumin can cross the blood-brain barrier. Um, and so there's obviously some different ways to do this. Traditionally, it would have been with the incorporation of a fat through the diet, but um, of course, things like the soluble fiber delivery from fenugreek seed make this much more bioavailable and allows it to live, um, as demonstrated, this ability to have more free curcuminoids in the blood plasma and for much longer. The mechanisms for the pharmacology of curcumin, uh, there are nearly 500 different cytokines that curcumin can work on in terms of modulating the inflammatory process. Um, majorly, it's going to help inhibit the expression of COX-2. Again, not its activity, but the expression, and we'll see that with herbs like willow as well that do this, where they allow COX-2 to be synthesized, but, um, but it's not going to inhibit its action entirely. Curcumin can also upregulate NERF-2. It has a NERF-2 activator and is greatly involved in, um, is a great herb, I should say, sort of for liver inflammation specifically and liver detoxification. It has potential pro-oxidant activity in higher dose concentrations, giving it a use sometimes you'll see in, um, in uh, uh, that's where it role might be in prevent having a bit of a cytotoxic or anti-tumorogenic effect. And it may even have potential cannabimetic effects as we are learning. So lots of interesting um, information about turmeric there that you can, you can dive into with those references. Willow, I'd love to talk about because one of my favorite trees, and so Salix alba, al Salix alba is the, the, the plant, the tree, I'm sorry, that's being used here that contains derivatives of salicylic acid, namely salicin. And the one thing I like to highlight about, so this is a herb that's used traditionally, been used traditionally for pain, for fever, for inflammation. Obviously, obviously it's where uh, aspirin or acetosalicylic was derived from. Uh, that's not to say that willow and acetos and aspirin can be used interchangeably. They can't, They're, they have some differences, of course. Um, again, herbs, not like drugs, but it does absolutely have the ability to um, affect and, and salicylic acid specifically can inhibit a key can transcription factor that mediates COX-2 transcription. So again, synthesis of COX-2, but can still help 
with the activation of the resolution phase of inflammation. An important kind of tidbit I like to share about willow is that it requires um, uh, the conversion of salicin to salicylic acid requires hydrolysis within the gut. And so a good healthy gut flora is important. If this is a herb that you're going to be given, and most of the clinical evidence around willow is around low back pain and osteoarthritis, it has some good evidence. I would often be prescribing it along with a probiotic just to ensure that that conversion is taking place. St. John's wort. So this might not be a herb that you would think of as a potent anti-inflammatory, but I might argue that the flavonoids in St. John's wort have nearly comparable evidence for anti-inflammatory activity to things like turmeric and other, um, and boswellia and plants that we might think of first. This is um, a plant that contains some interesting compounds, of course, a variety of flavonoids such as camphorol and quercetin, uh, as well as these naphthodianthros like hypericin um, and pseudohypericin and hyperforin, which is not that stable a molecule. Often we're looking at compounds that are rich in hypericin for their antiviral and their antidepressant or nervous system effects. Traditionally, this was a herb that was given in nerve pain, nerve inflammation, and we do know that hypericin can cross the blood-brain barrier, and we're learning more and more about um, potentially these um, this ability for St. John's wort to upregulate serum BDNF, or brain-derived neurotropic factor. And, and as we're looking at you know, depression as some uh, now as a, a, a case of the inflamed brain or inflammation within the nervous system causing these mood disorders, that's where I see our understanding of St. John's wort going much more so than just being a, a, you know, acting like an SSRI. It's really, really much more than that. Remember, we're getting this wide array of flavonoids that are working synergistically together to help reduce inflammation, specifically, though, I would say within the nervous system. Licorice. Licorice is a, a, the kind of classic adrenal tonic, and I'm remembering the important role of adaptogens in inflammation and in balancing cortisol. This is a key herb, I'd say, for patients who have trouble um, with, I would say, more so with low cortisol levels because it has this ability to spare cortisol in the body. It's not gonna spike cortisol levels super high in every case, um, like it's sometimes described as doing, but it will allow what is being made to, for the body to use it more effectively. And so kind of key constituents would be the saponins such as glycerizin, and there's also many different flavonoids and lots of mucilage found in this root that give it a variety of different applications with demulcent and anti-inflammatory properties. Um, I always like to highlight as well, this is another herb that we know that conversion in the gut by gut flora is really important for its activation. So for glycerizin to be activated into glyceratinic acid, which is much more potent in its ability to uh, inhibit enzymes like 5-beta reductase and 11-beta dehydrogenase that are involved in uh, allowing this sort of overall cortisol sparing, effect, having this um, aldosterone-like effect, which can sometimes lead to Pseudohyperaldosteronism as well, uh, which is the concern that many people have and, and is valid that we need to be careful sometimes with licorice in people with hypertension. Um, this can, of course, lead to kind of overall increased that mineral corticoid activity, but this is part of the mechanism we're after in that it leads to increased levels of, of cortisol potentially as well. So uh, licorice, I think, is, you know, has often a quiz question to my students is if you had to pick one herb that was as similar to uh, uh, hydrocortisone as possible, what would it be? And, and licorice would be my answer. And it, I should say it, it works very well topically as well in this way. Um, Boswellia, so we have another herb that's very well known for its anti-inflammatory effects. It's the resin of this plant, and I should just mention it's a fascinating history of this plant and relationship that humans have had with this resin. Um, it's been used since yeah, for a very, very long time. The resins contain boswellic acids, and these are generally what have been researched the most. There are a variety of different kinds of boswellic acids, but they have all been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier in animals, and it's, their bioavailability in humans has been very well established. It's uh, best taken about every six hours or so to maintain steady-state plasma levels. And it's also recommended to take Boswellia with a high-fat meal. Uh, this might increase its absorption and cause less stomach acid. So when I think about Boswellia, um, you know, it, because of its ability to cross the blood-brain barrier and its, its potent effect on 
specifically leukotrienes is kind of what is thought to be its main mechanism of action, even though I think it's, it's, it is much more than that, but the inhibition of glycoxygenase specifically, um, we're, we're also learning it has an ability to inhibit PGE2 as well, and that there are terpenes such as beta amarin and boswellia that also inhibit the degradation of our endogenous cannabinoids. So lots of interesting um, compounds. And, and again, it's so much more than just, just one specific one. It's many working together, collaborating together. And there is good evidence, I would say, for immunomodulatory effects, especially in conditions of excessive mucus production, so asthma and Crohn's disease, as well as rheumatoid arthritis and any sort of uh, neuroinflammation. Again, its ability to cross a blood-brain barrier gives it that important use there. And this is just one study I thought was interesting to highlight the use of synergy. It was it looked at the, um, the efficacy of combining curcumin and boswellic acid together. So these two compounds, and it found that it, there was an invert oh, that that there was an increased bioavailability when curcumin was administered with boswellic acid opposed to each given alone. And so putting plants together in a formula is the traditional way that herbs have often been prescribed and seeing these collaborative effects is something that comes up. There's many examples of this. This is just one I thought I would share um, specifically looking at uh, case of, uh, cases of osteoarthritis. Go to cola. So go to cola very quickly. This is my key anti-inflammatory herb. Uh, it's, it's saponins are, are it's kind of the asiaticocides are kind of the main constituent here. I think about this for wound healing. And so it is really ideal when maybe you're just you're tr you've already um, you're you're just sort of past the resolution phase of inflammation and now it's time to help the body repair and heal. Uh, that's really when I think about it. So it, you know those early stages of a wound and, and tissue repair is I think where it shines. It uh, oral administration has shown to increase collagen content and collagen cross-linking in especially uh, dermal wounds, skin wounds, and help with the improved um, reduce the formation of scar tissue as well. As well as uh, this is a herb that's traditionally been used as an adaptogen and a nervine tonic and have really powerful effects upon the nervous system. Um, this is a herb that I personally like to use every day. Uh, ashwagandha, so very popular plant, uh, growing in its popularity and our uh, understanding of all of its many benefits. Its steroidal saponins, specifically the withanolides, as well as lactones, I should say, excuse me, have, have been most investigated for their immune modulating, anti-inflammatory, and adaptogenic effects. And, you know, the key thing with these withanolides, I want to say, and on the next slide, you'll see um, just an example of all of the many ways that there, the withanolides can um, both have immune stimulating and inhibitory effects. So again, modulation being key, and it can be very frustrating sometimes when you look at herbal research, because you'll see that you know it's you're seeing an upregulation of certain cytokines and a downregulation of others and it's like well what is it doing well they're all working together to have this balancing effect and um i would say especially in models of stress and this is where the adaptogenic properties of uh of ashwagandha really come into play we see that in, it can help reduce anxiety reduce especially morning serum cortisol but can modulate cortisol depending on the bottom body's needs in chronically stressed healthy adults. And it does this, uh, there's a 2019 RCT that showed this, did this over two months. Um, it's especially good for non-restorative sleep and for improving thyroid function. So, uh, as well as having some other endocrine effects. All right, cat's claw. So cat's claw has been used in traditional Peruvian medicine as a, for a variety of degenerative and, degenerative and, and in chronic inflammatory conditions and specifically arthritis. And it's these alkaloids, the pentacyclic oxindole alkaloids that have been, and there's different phenotypes of this plant and specifically the ones that contain these alkaloids are, are it appears to be the most valuable, especially in suppressing, <clears throat> excuse me, in suppressing um, NF kappa beta and having anti inflammatory effects. And so, this is a plant, though, that does, I think, require some long term use. It has potent 
immune modulatory effects, and I see it especially being helpful in autoimmune cases of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, it has some evidence in HIV and in chronic sort of immune deficiencies. Um, interestingly, I just learned this, that it's the policy of the Brazilian government for a cat's claw tablets to be distributed free of charge to the population for the treatment of arthritis, which is kind of interesting. Ginger, I, I, uh, for the sake of time, I won't go too much into ginger, but I just want to say that it has so many similarities to turmeric. Uh, again, you just look at the rhizome, look at the beautiful flower of this plant, and then understand that it contains a very similar profile of terpenes and volatile oils. Um, sesquiterpenoids, like the tumorone compounds, are, are big in this plant that all work together to have, um, the, to have their inflammatory modulating effects definitely having an effect on signaling molecules like um, nuclear factor kappa beta, but uh, also just being a really delicious herb. If this is a herb, this is me holding a, a jar of some turmeric, uh, I'm sorry, of some ginger candy that actually a patient had made for me once that was, uh, that was so powerfully, it was the most potent ginger taste I've ever had in my life, but really delicious. And then finding, again, ways to incorporate ginger into the diet. And there have been some studies looking at the synergy between ginger and turmeric um, together. Uh, as well, I should just mention, there are flavonoids such as camphorol that have been found in ginger and uh, that might also have some effects on endocannabinoid tone. So, perhaps looking at uh, another plant that acts within our endocannabinoid system. And then nettle. So nettle is a plant I always like to talk about because I think it gets overlooked a little bit. It, it's such a nutritive um, and powerful herb that is underused, I think. And it, I love it because it has such a low toxicity profile. It's so safe. I've never seen anybody respond negatively to it. And I'm talking not to the fresh plant. Obviously, if you take this fresh leaf, uh, you're going to have a reaction to this plant. Uh, I like to say it's almost a little rite of passage for a lot of herbalists to get stung at least once by a nettle leaf. This is a picture of me actually growing my nettle leaf on my patio so that I could sting myself with it for the first time because uh, I, I wanted to know what it was like. And it, you know, it does. It does. Those leaves contain a wide array of chemical constituents that cause burning and um, such as acetylcholine and histamine there's serotonin and small amounts of leukotrienes in those leaves as well that will cause this um, this a, a, a contact dermatitis and so this is, is interesting because we use that nettle is sometimes used as a counter irritant to kind of stimulate the immune system and stimulate a bit of an inflammatory response so that you can help resolve the inflammation. Um, and, you know, traditionally you would actually like use this leaf on an arthritic joint and cause an inflammatory process to reduce pain um, in the future which uh, I've never done, but I have heard reports that it has been helpful. And I just wanna highlight that it is distinct from the root. So nettle root has its own distinct uses, specifically in BPH, for example. Um, we are talking mainly about the leaf, but I love this plant because it's so nutritive. It's so cleansing of metabolic waste from the body and you can take lots of it. And there have been some randomized controls trials in um, joint pain, and it does appear that some of the compounds are perhaps best extracted in alcohol. So uh, an alcohol extract might be good here, but the infusion, if it's steeped long and overnight is really effective and I um, rich in magnesium and chlorophyll and potassium and, and lots of key nutrients as well. And the last herb is hemp that we're going to touch on. And so uh, I think this will be covered by Slavco, I'm sure. <laughs> so I don't want to spend too much time here, but understanding that the phytocannabinoid profile in hemp and is, is, is rich in compounds that can support the tone of our endocannabinoid system. You know, chi in traditional Chinese medicine, cannabis, they've known about the healing properties of cannabis for since 2000 BC. Um, and it's been quoted as undoing rheumatism, this plant. So I can recognizing for chronic inflammation, especially joint pain, that this is a plant they would be turning to. And that hemp oil can provide polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are precursors to a lot of the, the, the structure of our endocannabinoid system. 
Uh, we also know, of course, modulation of CB1 and CB2 receptors can take place with phytocannabinoids, and we're learning more about terpenes, such as the beta carophylline that can act directly at CB2, but it's really not about one specific phytocannabinoid here. It's about that entourage effect, then all working together um, to help support endocannabinoid tone. Okay, so coming back to our case, um, and what would we prescribe? So I've just kind of highlighted a few, <laughs> quite a few plants, and I'm hoping that maybe as you went through, you're thinking, all right, well, I can see maybe which might be preferred in a case of pain, MSK inflammation, stress, and poor sleep. You know, what might we be looking to? And we have all of these options, but how do we choose and which are going to be the best choice for the patient? Um, so it's very easy to go to the big guns. You can absolutely just choose turmeric in, in this case or choose Boswellia, and I'm sure that she would notice a benefit. But to look at it a little bit more holistically, I think you're going to see you can get um, a better, especially long-term result. And I, I like bringing up this idea of you know, the myth of the panacea plant, that there's one plant that can um, be used. Anybody who kind of sells me on you know, one soup, the new superfood or the new super plant or whatever, I'm always a little bit hesitant because there is really no herbal shotgun. shotgun. It's, um, you know, it's fitting the right plant for the right person and also understanding that plants like to work together and that there can be synergy in combining them together. And treating inflammation especially is there's no one dimensional remedy. It really requires a multi-dimensional therapeutic approach. Um, addressing not just the inflammatory cascade, but the HPA axis, potentially the endocannabinoid system, and um, and you know all of the other lifestyle and dietary factors as well. And just thinking, thinking more about the systems that we want to support rather than the symptoms that we want to suppress. And I mentioned already a few times now this idea of plant synergy. And you know, luckily there are some very thoughtfully formulated products that exist uh, that put kind of these key herbs together, just need to know what, when those are going to be best used because um, you know, timing can play a role in this as well. So looking at our herbal approach in this case, so remember she was experiencing um, MSK pain in her wrist and her back. She's been experiencing it for about three months. It was really interfering with her life. The pain level was quite high, nine out of 10 in the morning and stress was quite high and she was not sleeping well. So. This is just an example. This is not complete in any way, but I thought I would use it as an example to show you sort of how my clinical thinking would be around what would be my first line, my second line, and my third line. So what would I prioritize as being most important in this case? And for her, we need to get her feeling better. So we really want to support the resolution of inflammation and we want to control her pain. I'd be looking at using herbs that are kind of their, my big shotgun anti-inflammatories as well as analgesics to help control the pain. And I've just kind of started brainstorming what some of these herbs might be. And I always like to say every time that you formulate for a patient is an opportunity to just expand your herbal repertoire, to learn more, to dig a little deeper into plants. And you know, this really I think builds your confidence and builds your ability to get better clinical results. So that, anyhow, is my first strategy. And so I've listed some herbs for you there. Second line. So what if she, if that's all she could take today, that's that's what I would give her. One of one of those herbs or a combination of those first line herbs. Second line, I need to address her HPA dysregulation, and I can do that with adaptogens, with my nervine tonics and some of maybe some sedatives to help with sleep. And so I start brainstorming what some of those herbs might be. And then finally, I really want to look at supporting tissue regeneration and in supporting detoxification processes so that she can really heal and we're again not just not just treating her pain and calling it a day i want to see this kind of ongoing long-term support so that it doesn't come back or potentially come back as, as badly and i can do this with my connective tissue tonics uh, go to cola being a really key one for for me here so just keeping in mind that every herb on this list will help control inflammation to some degree. It's just some are going to be perhaps better suited given her particular case. And so I just want to highlight too the most important thing, uh, most common mistake in herbal prescribing, I would say, is missing the therapeutic dose. And so that can sometimes be the practitioner not saying, you know, giving enough uh, of a dose is, is probably the most common issue or the patient who decides that 
they are, you know, they're just not being very compliant and then they don't get the results they see and they're disappointed. And it's like, well, we need to help people understand again that herbs aren't drugs. You don't take one one day and everything goes away. It's about creating more of a lifestyle. So general dosing principles, know your patient. Carrie Bone says person plus purpose equals proportions. And I like to think of this also as big disease needs big medicine. So if you've got a really large male individual who has a really extreme amount of pain, that person is going to need a much higher dose than your, you know, 100 pound female who's got six out of 10 pain. It's might, you know, it's not going to be the same. Um, and there also are practices of more pharmacological versus physiological prescribing, which I'll touch on very quickly, really, as long as you're staying within your dosing ranges. Um, and you know there is some flexibility here as well. You just want to ensure that you're not going into, of course, toxic dosing ranges, and that you monitor appropriately and adjust appropriately if needed, and you recognize um, any sort of signs of a toxicity, symptom, or adverse effect. So it, uh, this concept of physiological versus pharmacological prescribing, I, I like to kind of classify these as, uh, group them as my, my herbal tonics or my herbal effectors. And I've actually kind of divided them up for you here to show, okay, herbs that I consider to be tonics, so herbs that I would like her to be taking more long-term as a regulating, balancing approach to um, to her her case would be things like the adaptogens, the nervine tonics, the connective tissue tonics, and, and vascular tonics as well. Whereas the effectors that I'm going to be giving to help really just reduce her pain uh, and get her sleeping well are going to be things like the analgesics and the sedatives. And so I might be using those at higher ends of their dosing range for a shorter period of time than the normalizers, which I almost think of like foods, like things we want to be incorporating over time in order to get the best effect. And then remember, um, you know, the anti-inflammatories are going to be in both of these categories, but they can of course be, they could, they could fall under either category here being a more, I would think of the more as a tonic though, again. Safety considerations, I've you know mentioned this a few times now. Of course, go to your references, make sure you're aware um, if there's any risk here, you know, there are many drug interactions, things like that, they do exist. Um, but in general, herbs are gonna be a lot safer than a lot of the medications that are prescribed for these types of things. So my herbal protocol. Here I, I'm giving you an example of what was done. So uh, as my effectors, and when I think short term, I'm thinking about one to two weeks at a high end dosing range with turmeric, hemp oil, those were mainly for that resolution of her of the inflammation, as well as ashwagandha. This is something that um, I would recommend probably before bed, either as probably as a liquid. I like to give ashwagandha just as a little shot as a liquid. The turmeric, I'm looking at a dose of about six grams twice a day, maybe three. And the hemp oil, about 100 milligrams um, a day, and that can be taken anytime it's convenient. Kava, I didn't get a chance to talk about today, but I do like kava as a, again, before bed, as an anxiolytic and also as an analgesic about 50 milligrams cavalactones, and then a nettle leaf infusion, or what's nice is also to use the liquid extract of nettle leaf, uh, a teaspoon in a cup of hot water taken three times a day, um, or just added to her water bottle that she can drink throughout the day. And so all of that, my goal is get inflammation, um, so dampen down, but help with resolution, address her pain, and get her sleeping better and stress starting to improve. Long term, if she's willing to do it, then I'm looking at Nervine tonics. So over the next course of the few months, I need to get her stress under control and start healing those tissues. And so St. John's wort, um, skull cap, schizandra, saffron uh, as a combination. It's really beautiful that works to do this. I've seen it so many times with stress and anxiety. Go to cola for its, um, and, and ginkgo and grapeseed. Again, those herbs have a great synergy together to help with that regeneration of damaged connective tissues. And if she's willing to do it, um, and in this case, she she was pretty motivated, so we continued the turmeric, but lowered the dose at just once a day. Uh, ashwagandha was an occasional; she didn't do it every single night. Same thing with the cavas; we started to see sleep improve over the the uh, few weeks or so. And the nettle infusion, she just really enjoyed, so I wanted to encourage her to keep doing doing that as well. 
Okay, so as a summary, um, please think of herbs as so much more than just being anti-inflammatory. Uh, I think hopefully you've learned something new about some of these herbs that are just kind of given that label and, and that's about it, that there's so much more to them and how they work and we're just continuing to learn more, that we want to think about addressing systems, um, especially HPA access, I would say, and endocannabinoid system, and, and improving their overall activity and tone versus just suppressing their symptoms. Know your patient and dose appropriately. So dosing might need to be played with, but it's, um, it's a really important part to see the outcomes that you want. Begin to expand your herbal repertoire if you can. Maybe you learned, maybe there's a herb today that you haven't used before. Learn a little bit more about it and it might be the right fit for your next patient. Leverage plant synergy. So remember that combining herbs together, often we get this greater sum, this collaborative uh, effect, overall effect. And that lastly, herbs are not a band-aid for poor diet and lifestyle habits. We can't expect for everything to get better just with our, with our herbs. We need to be doing the other work. So um, for me, that's, you know, I really encourage people getting out into nature, connecting with nature is number one, a little bit of exercise and just, it, you know, trying to optimize diet as, as best they can with sort of key nutrients, especially helping with stress. So 